Hello, I'm Mr. Eliason, and welcome to APUSH. Today we're going to move away from foreign policy for the most part and talk about the way that this developing Cold War has transformed American foreign policy and led us into what may or may not be an unreasonable frenzy and fear of communism. You know, or maybe it's totally reasonable. We'll try to figure that out today. So here's our objectives for today. We'll take a moment and talk through these and then we'll move forward. So Harry Truman was elected, as you hopefully remember, by a pretty razor slim margin based on a combination of his calling a special session of Congress and traveling all the way across the country and giving impromptu speeches. And so despite the fact that he was reelected as president, uh, he would still struggle to get his domestic agenda enacted. And so Truman's domestic agenda was known as the Fair Deal. It was an expanded New Deal style social safety net programs, including stuff like, you know, providing full and permanent full employment and health care for everybody. And so all of this was pretty ambitious. And yeah, minimum wage, greater unemployment composition, housing assistance, all of this stuff. And so Truman's going to propose all of this stuff. But for the most part, he's going to really struggle to get the Democratic coalition behind it. And so most of this fair deal legislation is going to totally die in Truman's imagination. And he's going to not be able to push Congress to enact more or less any of it for a couple different reasons. One is that in the aftermath of both World War II and as the Korean War was going on, Americans were somewhat concerned about increased governmental spending and the size of government. We're trying to, uh, you know, there was some concern that we needed to sort of scale back all of this stuff and get our spending onto a more reasonable track. And the other problem is the New Deal coalition is a pretty fragile coalition. And as Truman did stuff like desegregate the armed forces, he's going to immediately, immediately alienate white Southerners who are going to torpedo almost all of the rest of his agenda. And so here are the metaphorical worms in Truman's New Deal apples or a fair deal apples. And the fair deal is going to fail to get enacted. Congress is, in fact, going to go the other way, and they're going to weaken protections for workers with what's called the Taft-Hartley Bill. Uh, the Taft-Hartley Bill banned closed shop unions or closed shop industries, which is the idea that you had to, that uh, in a closed shop, you can compel workers to join a union, forcing all workers to be unionized and significantly increasing their bargaining power. But the Taft-Hartley Bill banned that. Truman would then veto the Taft-Hartley Bill, but it would pass over his veto. And so increased protections for workers are going to kind of get wrapped up in this whole Red Scare thing. And we're going to see Congress pushing back against Truman's attempts to pass New Deal agendas because most of the United States domestic policy is instead going to be focused on this whole Red Scare thing. The Red Scare was kicked off by a whole variety of different things. I mean, the rising power of the Soviet Union is, of course, one. Uh, the failures in Asia, especially China, fall into communism is two. And the whole Rosenberg case is three. So the Rosenbergs were working for Julius Rosenberg, worked for the Manhattan Project, and was definitely passing information to the Russians. And so when the Russians tested their own atomic bomb, there was this scramble to figure out, like, well, did was there some leak from our secret program? And it turns out absolutely they were. And so Julius Rosenberg was put to death, and Ethel Rosenberg was also executed for spying for the Soviet Union. Uh, Alger Hiss is a Democratic state official who was also accused of passing secrets to the Soviet Union. And so the second Red Scare is this fear that communists have to some degree infiltrated all, all, you know, a lot of different levels of American society and are secretly working to undermine the United States and past interests to the Soviets. So uh, this leads to a massive sort of hunt for these communists led by people like Richard Nixon. Uh, Richard Nixon was a young House member from California who's going to get involved with what's called the House Un-American Activities Committee, or HUAC. And he's going to be one of the lead prosecutors against Alger Hiss, and then is going to be one of the strongest anti-communist crusaders in the United States. So the second Red Scare is designed to uncover communists. So how do we know who a communist is? Well, this helpful pamphlet from a ball bearing company helps you to understand sort of what com well, who communists are and what they're trying to do. So pause and read. And the second Red Scare, unlike the first Red Scare, didn't really use deportations or throwing people in jail to punish the suspected communists. 
Instead, it was uh, the House Un-American Activities Committee would charge people with this or accuse people of this. They then would drag them in for hearings. And then after that, they would be what is called blacklisted, sort of uh, informally punished, fired from their jobs. Uh, banks wouldn't do business with them. Basically, you, uh, you're isolating them socially and economically. And uh, this doesn't sound terrible for a lot of people, but it's important to understand here, you should read this, uh, why people would cooperate with HUAC in order to get off the blacklist. So pause, read. And so the takeaway here is that we, uh, so the HUAC goes after Hollywood, accusing Hollywood producers of putting communist propaganda in your movies. And you basically have two choices if you get called in front of HUAC. You can deny all the charges, be labeled a communist, and be blacklisted. Or you can cooperate with HUAC, appoint two other people who might be communists around you, and then you are seen as sort of cooperating with the investigation, and you're let off. Ronald Reagan famously uh, cooperated to some extent with HUAC and uh, was not blacklisted because of it. And so there's this question of either you admit to some degree of communist activity and are let off the hook, or you try to deny it all and you're, hor and you're punished socially and economically. And so that's how the second Red Scare worked. Uh, eventually, the second Red Scare would be codified in law. The, the uh, McCarran Act, passed by Pat McCarran here of Nevada, is going to you know, basically ban communists from having government jobs. It's going to require loyalty oaths in a lot of fields, including teachers would have to take loyalty oaths because people were very concerned that these sort of liberal teachers were indoctrinating students to you know, hate America and love communism. And so all of this is going to codify the sort of anti-communist lean and the leaning in the U.S. government. Communists would be banned for passports, banned for getting passports, banned for defense industries. They'd have to register with the government. And it really is going to totally crush any sort of communist movement in the United States to the extent in which it existed. So it becomes not illegal to be a communist, but you definitely become a second class citizen if you're an admitted communist. The late Red Scare is um, characterized by the rise of Joseph McCarthy. Uh, Joseph McCarthy uh, lays out in this famous speech in Wheeling, West Virginia, that he knows for a fact that there are a number of communists working for the State Department and the U.S. government trying to bring down the United States. The number of communists that he has revealed uh, varies from speech to speech, and he never actually reveals the names of any of these communists, but he does use it to get significant power in the Senate to hold massive hearings and to, uh, you know, target his political enemies and to make himself one of the most famous people in the United States. He, uh, his rise to power coincides with the early 1950s, but he's eventually brought down when he decides to try to take on communism in the army. The army McCarthy hearings uh, end up being very unpopular, both because they are televised. And so McCarthy's sort of bullying and lack of substance is revealed for all the American public to see, but also because the army refuses to play ball and be intimidated by McCarthy. And so in the end, we have this famous exchange with uh, McCarthy being told, that, you know, you've done enough. Have you no sense of decency and support will fall away from McCarthy and the Red Scare will come to a close. Truman is not going to run for re-election in 1952, both because, you know, he sort of served two terms, but also because, you know, he was not very popular at this point. Both political parties were trying to court General Dwight Eisenhower to be their nominee. And in the, but in the end, despite Truman's attempts to get Eisenhower to run as a Democrat, he's going to run as a Republican. He's going to put the anti-communist crusader Richard Nixon on the ticket in order to, you know, get both be, you know, skew a little younger and get California. The Democrats are going to nominate Adelaide Stevenson, who, uh, you know, is just kind of a middle, you know, an uninspiring new dealer is, I guess, how I would describe him. And his campaign uh, cordons on to this idea, this picture that was taken of him with a hole in his shoe, which they're going to use to try to like paint him as a common man. You know, Adelaide's got a hole in his shoe, just like you've got a hole in your shoe, et cetera, et cetera. Which turns out to be not be not be very effective because the Eisenhower administration comes up with a series of awesome television ads. So if you've never read Eisenhower Answers America, you should 100% go and look those up. Sorry, you should watch Eisenhower Answers America where he has these TV spots answering people's questions, which is pretty cool and different. And of course, if you've never seen the I Like Ike cartoon, you 100% should see the I Like Ike cartoon. 
So we're starting to see candidates use television advertisement in order to build support. So that's neat. Definitely go watch I Like Ike and then, you know, get it stuck in your head for the next month. All of this leads to a sweeping victory for the Republican Party and for Eisenhower in 1952. You can see the South is still voting against Abraham Lincoln, but Eisenhower is going to win most of the rest of the country on account of his, you know, skilled leadership and savvy political instincts, uh, you know, and, you know, popular general from the Second World War, all that fun stuff. So Eisenhower is going to be president. Under him, uh, you know, we're going to get kind of a return to normalcy period here. We'll talk some more about the domestic effects tomorrow. But for now, you're going to see the increase, for example, in the use of nuclear energy because he's going to create a commission to study whether or not we can use nuclear energy to generate power as well. And so this is going to be the beginnings of nuclear power plants in the United States. We're going to kick off the space race when Sputnik is launched. Sputnik is the first uh, man-made object to be put into orbit and was launched by the Soviet Union. This kicks off a massive phase of sort of Sputnik mania in which the United States is very, very concerned that we're falling behind, you know, technologically and scientifically to our Soviet enemies. And so clearly something needs to be done to get us to catch up. And so what we end up doing is, you know, we create NASA. We start getting involved in the space program ourselves. We're going to, to some degree, overhaul our sort of STEM education in order to make sure that our education systems are producing, you know, the sort of skills that modern Americans need. And so we're going to refocus on all of that stuff. And for foreign policy, Eisenhower was a really savvy foreign policy operator. He was a skilled bridge player and, you know, understood sort of the, the geopolitical strategy as far as all of this. And so the Eisenhower doctrine is going to be trying to stop Russian uh, infiltration or influence in the third world. So where the Truman Doctrine is we're trying to prevent European countries from turning to communism, domino theory is stopping Asian countries from turning to communism, the Eisenhower Doctrine is we're going to try to stop third world countries from turning to communism. Sometimes we're going to do that through some military force. For example, Mohammed Mossadegh is a sort of left-leaning uh, Iranian politician who's elected to be prime minister of Iran in the early 1950s. And a joint CIA-British coup is going to overthrow him and give increased power to the Shah of Iran, which is going to have pretty problematic consequences. We were somewhat worried about Mossadegh nationalizing Iran's oil reserves, but also pretty concerned about him, you know, developing closer relations with the Russians. So that's a problem. Gamal Nasser in Egypt, he's the sort of secular, secular dictator of Egypt, is going to use Cold War tensions to the advantage of Egypt. For example, turning to both the U.S. and the Soviets in order to get support for the Aswan High Dam project, basically going to both sides, you know, and saying, hey, you know, the Americans are giving us X amount of money for this project. What can you offer? You know, and sort of uh, playing the two parents off each other type thing. And in the Suez crisis, he's also going to nationalize the Suez Canal and then do the same thing. England, France, and Israel are going to seize control of the Suez Canal once uh, as Gamal Nasser tries to nationalize it. And it's going to create a massive international incident because he's going to ask for Soviet help. And so, we're, well, the, the Americans are feared that if Soviet troops get there, one, it could lead to a hot war. But two, it's almost certainly going to lead to increased Soviet influence in Egypt. And so Eisenhower is going to demand that the British, French, and Israelis back down, and Nasser is going to successfully seize control of the Suez Canal. In Cuba, we're going to fail to some extent. Uh, our hand-picked dictator, uh, Batista here, is going to be overthrown. Uh, he was one of our dictators, you know, sort of protecting American business interests. Uh, he's going to lose a long guerrilla war to a guy named Fidel Castro who at the time, you know, we were somewhat concerned about, but he wasn't a full-on communist for the most part, for the, for the most of the time that he was leading his resistance movement. And so Eisenhower did come up with a plan to restore, to overthrow Castro and restore sort of an American-backed government, but he did not have time to carry it out. And so the Cuban Revolution represents, you know, a, I mean, a failure is maybe too strong of a word because, you know, to what extent should we be backing dictators in Latin America? But, you know, anyway, uh, but... It, we are a dictator fell, and this, especially when Castro is going to sort of turn to communism and we're going to have the whole Cuban Missile thing, is going to make us even more reluctant to support any sort of regime change in Latin America. So keep that in mind as well. During the late Eisenhower administration, because of, you know, the new Soviet leaders, Nikita Khrushchev's more sort of capitalist economic posturing, we're going to have a thaw in relations. 
Nixon is going to travel to Russia and famously have a debate with Khrushchev, the kitchen debate, which is another thing that if you've never watched, you 100% need to go and find the video of Nixon and Khrushchev arguing in the kitchen debate and watch that because it's pretty great. And the Soviet Union is going to, to some degree, try to mirror sort of American economic developments, opening their first supermarkets and things like that in some of their satellite states like Yugoslavia. So that's pretty neat. So again, go definitely go and watch the kitchen debate. Uh, if you haven't watched it, it's pretty fabulous. The space race is going to be kicked off in earnest with both us and the Soviets uh, attempting to put uh, both animals and then people in space and eventually with the goal being racing to the moon. So we'll spend more time on that as we move forward. But keep in mind, all of this is happening in the background. And the U-2 crisis brings an end to this period of cooperation and begins the ratcheting up of tensions that will end with the Cuban Missile Crisis. The U-2 is an American spy plane. Uh, it was fly They flew, flew at very high altitudes with high-resolution cameras sort of on the stomach of the plane. And uh, the theory was that they flew so high that they were, one, undetectable, and two, outside of Soviet missile range. Unfortunately, both of these things turn out to be not true when an American U-2 plane is downed and when the pilot, Powers here, does not commit suicide and is captured alive. This creates a massive international incident, both because of the Eisenhower administration's lies about the U-2 project, but also because we're running high-level surveillance above the Soviet Union. And so it's going to lead to an increase in tensions, which again, eventually get us to the Cuban Missile Crisis. So that's the Cold War in the United States. For next time, we're going to talk about the economic developments of the 1950s. But for now, we'll leave you there. So thank you for listening.